right. Let me get my... And by the way, after this book, we're going to be doing uh, the first Harry Dresden book, too. I have determined that's where we're going with this. <laughs> so, anyway. I guess we... we uh, I guess all good book readers start with... Storytime with Sin, Part 2. Live reading of Good Omens by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. Wednesday. It was a hot, fume-filled August day in central London. Warlock's 11th birthday was very well attended. There were 20 small boys and 17 small girls. There were a lot of men in, with identical blonde crew cuts, dark blue suits, and shoulder holsters. There was a crew of caterers who had arrived bearing jellies, cakes, and bowls of crisps. Now, for those of you that are not UK familiar, uh, jellies is very much like jello here, and crisps is what we call potato chips. I sometimes I have to translate from the UK version. Their procession of vans was led by a vintage Bentley. The amazing Harvey and Wanda children's parties especially had been both struck down by an unexpected tummy bug, but by a pro providential turn of fortune, the replacement had turned up practically out of the blue, a stage magician. Everyone has his little hobby, despite Crowley's urgent advice, as Aziraphale was intending to turn his to good use. Aziraphale was particularly proud of his magical skills. He had attended a class in the 1870s run by John Maskelyne, and it's been almost a year practicing since seeing sleight of hand palming coins and taking rabbits out of hats. He had got, he felt, time quite good at it. The point was that although Aziraphale was capable of doing things that could make the entire magic circle hand in their wands, he never applied what might be called his intrinsic powers to the practice of sleight of hand conjuring, which was a major drawback. He was beginning to wish he'd continue practicing. Now you have to remember, this was set probably in mid-80s, late, you know, early 90s, so uh, let's see the date on this. Uh, buh, 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 buh. 1990. So, bear that in mind when I read this next bit. Still, he mused, it was like riding a velocipede. He never forgot how. His magician's coach had been a little dusty, but it felt good once it was on. Even his old patter, came, patter began to come back to him. The children watched him in a blank, disdainful incomprehension. Behind the buffet, Crowley, in his white waiter's coat, cringed with contact and embarrassment. Now then, young masters and mistresses, do you see my battered old top hat? What a shocking bad hat, as you youngins say. And see, there's nothing in it, but bless my britches. Who's this rum customer? Why, it's our furry friend, Harry the Rabbit. It was in your pocket, pointed out Warlock. The other children nodded in agreement. What did he think they were, kids? As if I remembered what Masculine had told him about dealing with hecklers. Make a joke of it, you pudding heads, and I do mean you, Mr. Fell. The name as if had adopted at that time. Make them laugh and they'll forgive you anything. Oh, so you rumbled my hat trick, he chuckled. The children stared at him impassively. You're rubbish, said Warlock. I wanted cartoons anyway. He's right, you know, agreed a small girl with a ponytail. You are rubbish and probably a, a word I can't say on stream. <laughs> now, so, like I said, 1990. Aziraphale stared desperately at Crowley. As far as he was concerned, young Warlock was obviously infernally tainted and so the sooner the black dog turned up, they could get away from this place the better. Now, do you, any of you youngins have such a thing as a threepenny a bit about your persons? No, young, no, young master. Then what is this I see behind your ear? I got cartoons at my birthday, announced the little girl. And I got Transformers and My Little Pony. <laughs> and I'm Decepticon Tacker and a Thunder Tank and a Crowley groan. Children's parties are obviously places where any angel with an ounce of common sense should fare to tread. Piping infants were raised in cynical merriment as Aziraphale dropped three link metal rings. It, and it's not even P, it's not, not not even not PG. It's not even PC. <laughs> Crowley, let's say, Crowley looked away and his gaze fell on a table heaped high with presents from a tall plastic structure. Two beady eyes, beady little eyes stared back at him. Crowley scrutinized them for a glint of red fire. You could never be certain when you're dealing with the bureaucrats of hell. It is always possible they had sent him a gerbil instead of a dog. No, it was a perfectly normal gerbil. It appeared to be living in an exciting construction of cylinder spheres and treadmills, such as the Spanish Inquisition would have devised if they had had access to plastic molding press. 
He checked his watch. It had never occurred to Crowley to change his battery, which had robbed away three years previously, but it still kept perfect time. It was two minutes to three. Aziraphale was getting more and more flustered. Do any of the company here assembled possess such a thing as about their persons as a pocket handkerchief? No. In Victorian days, it had been unheard of for people not to carry handkerchiefs and the trick, which involved magically producing a, a dove, which even now peck, was pecking irritably at Aziraphale's wrist, could not proceed without one. The angel tried to attract Crowley's attention, failed, and in desperation pointed to one of the security guards who shifted uneasily. You, my fine jack sauce, come here. Now, if you inspect your breast pocket, I think you might find a fine silk handkerchief. No, sir. I'm afraid not, sir, said the guard straight ahead. Aziraphale winked desperately. Now, go on, dear boy. Take a look, please. The guard reached inside, reached a hand inside his inside pocket and, surprised, pulled out a handkerchief, duck egg blue silk with lace edging. Aziraphale realized almost immediately that the lace had been a mistake as it caught on the guard's holstered gun and sent it spinning across the room to land heavily in a bowl of jelly. The children applauded spasmodically. Hey, not bad, said the ponytail girl. Warlock had already run across the room and grabbed the gun. <laughs> Hands up, dog breasts, he shouted gleefully. The security guards were in a quandary. Some of them fumbled down weapons. Others started edging their way toward or away from the boy. The other children started complaining that they wanted guns as well, and a few of the more forward ones tried to start tugging them from the guards, who had been thoughtless enough to take their weapons out. Then someone, threw some, then someone threw some jelly at Warlock. The boy squeaked and pulled the trigger of the gun. It was a Magnum 32. CIA-issued, gray, mean, heavy, capable of blowing a man away at 30 paces, and leaving nothing more than a red mist, a ghastly mess, and a certain amount of paperwork. Aziraphale blinked. A thin, thin stream of water squirted from the nozzle and soaked Crowley, who had been looking out the window, trying to see if there was a huge black dog in the garden. Aziraphale looked embarrassed. Then a cream cake hit him in the face. It was almost five past three. With a gesture, Aziraphale turned the rest of the guns into water pistols, water pistols as well and walked out. Crowley found him on the pavement outside, trying to extricate a rather squishy dove from the arm of his frock coat. It's late, said Aziraphale. I can see that, said Crowley. Comes of sticking it up your sleeve. He reached out and pulled the limp bird from Aziraphale's coat and breathed life back into it. The dove cooed appreciably and felt, flew off a trifle warily. Not the bird, said the angel. The dog. It's late. Crowley shook his head thoughtfully. We'll see. He opened the door, flipped on the radio. I should be so lucky, lucky, lucky. I should be so. Hello, Crowley. Hello, um, who is this? Dagon, Lord of the Flies, Master of the Madness, Under Duke of the Seventh Torment, what can I do for you? The Hellhound, I'm just, uh, checking to see that it got off okay. Released ten minutes ago, why? Hasn't it arrived? Is something wrong? Oh no, nothing wrong. Everything's fine. Oh, I can see it now. Good dog. Nice dog. Everything's terrific. You're doing a great job down there, people. Well, lovely talking to you, Dagon. Catch you soon, huh? He flipped off the radio. They stared at each other. There was a loud bang from inside the house and a window shattered. Oh dear. Better deserve I'm not swearing with the practice ease of someone who has spent 6,000 years not swearing. And who wasn't going to start now? I must have missed one. No dog, said Crowley. No dog, said Azurafel. The demon sighed. Get in the car, he said. We've got lots. We've got to talk about this. Oh, and Azurafel? Yeah? Clean off that blasted cream cake before you get in. It was a hot, silent August day, far from central London. By the side of the Tadfield Road, the dust weighed down the hogweed. Bees buzzed in the hedges. The air had a leftover and reheated feel. There was a sound like a thousand metal voices shouting, Hail! cut off abruptly. And there was a black dog in the road. It had to be a dog. It was dog-shaped. There are some dogs which, when you meet them, remind you that despite thousands of years of man-made evolution... Every dog is still only two meals away from being a wolf. These dogs advanced deliberately, purposely. The wilderness made flesh. Their teeth yellow, their breath a stink, while in the distance their owners twitter. He's an old soppy village. Just poke him if he's a nuisance. And in the green of their eyes, the red campfires of the Pleistine gleam and flicker. This dog would make even that dog like that slink nonchalantly behind the sofa and pretend to be extremely preoccupied with its rubber bone. It was already growling, and the growl was a low, rumbling snarl of spring-coiled menace, the sort of growl that starts in the back of one throat 
and ends up in someone else's. Saliva dripped from its jaws and sizzled on the tar. It took a few steps forward, sniffed the sunlit air. Its ears flicked up. There were voices a long way off, a voice, a boyish voice, but one it had been created to obey. One could not, could not help but obey. When that voice said follow, it would follow. When it said kill, it would kill his master's voice. It left the hedge and padded across the field beyond. A grazing bull eyed it for a moment, weighed its chances, and then strode hurriedly toward the opposite hedge. The voices were coming from a copse of straggly trees. The black hound sunk closer, jaw streaming. One of the other voices said, he never will. You always say he will, man, he never does. Catch your dad giving you a pet and an interesting pet anyway. It'll probably be stick insects. That's your dad's idea of interesting. The hound gave the canine equivalent of a shrug, but immediately lost interest because now the master of the center of its universe spoke. It'll be a dog, it said. Huh. You don't know it's going to be a dog. No one said it's going to be a dog. How do you know it's going to be a dog if no one said your dad would be complaining about the food it eats the whole time. Privet, the third voice was rather more primitive than the first two. The owner of the voice, like that, would be the sort of person who, before making a plastic model kit, would not only separate and count all the parts before commencing, as per the instructions, but also paint the bits that needed painting first, and leave them to dry properly prior to construction. <laughs> I know people like that. All that separated this voice from chartered accountancy was a matter of time. They don't eat privet, Wednesday. You've never seen a dog eat privet. Stick insects do, I mean. They're jolly interesting, actually. They eat each other when they're mating. Stick insects is what they call prey mantises, by the way. In case you're wondering. There's also something as called it, just as a stick insect as well. There was a thoughtful pause. The hound slunk closer and realized the voices were coming from a hole in the ground. The trees, in fact, concealed an ancient chalk quarry, now half overgrown with thorn trees and vines, ancient but clearly not disused. Tr tracks crisscrossed it, smooth areas of slope indicated regular use by skateboards, and wall of death, or at least wall of seriously grazed knee cyclists. Old bits of dangerously frayed rope hung from some of the more accessible greenery, and here and there sheets of corrugated iron and old wooden boards were wedged in branches. A burnt-out, rustling, triumph herald estate was visible, half-submerged in drifted nettles. In one corner, a tangle of wheels and corroded wire marked the side of the famous lost graveyard where the supermarket trolleys came to die. If you were a child, it was paradise. The, the local adults called it the pit. The hound peered through a clump of nettles and spotted four figures sitting in the center of the quarry on the in indispensable prop to good secret dens everywhere, the common milk crate. They don't. They do. Bet you they don't, said the first speaker. It had a certain temper to it that identified as young and female, and it was tended with horrified fascination. They do, actually. I had six before we went on holiday, and I forgot to change the privet. When I came back, I had one big fat one. Nah, that's not stick insects. That's praying medicines, see. I saw on television where this big female one ate this other one. It didn't hardly take any notice. There was another crowded pause. What were they praying about, said his master's voice. They don't pray they don't get married, I expect. The, the hound managed to get one huge eye against an, an, an enemy knot hole. I don't think, I, don't, I think empty knot hole, I think. And the cord is broken down, vents and squinted downward. Anyway, it's like with bikes, the first speaker, said the first speaker authoritatively. I thought I was going to get this bike with seven gears and one of them razor blade saddles and purple paint and everything. And then they gave me this light blue one with a basket, a girl's bike. Well, you are a girl, said one of the others. That's sexism, that is, going around giving people girly presents just because they're a girl. I'm going to get a dog, said his master's voice firmly. His master had his back to him. The hound couldn't quite make out his features. Oh, yeah, one of those big, great big rottweilers, yeah, said the girl with withering sarcasm. No, it's going to be the kind of dog you can have fun with, said his master's voice. Not a big dog. The eye and the nose vanished abruptly downwards. But one of those dogs that's brilliantly intelligent can go down rabbit holes and has one funny ear that always looks inside out and a proper mongrel too. A pedigree mongrel. Unheard by those within, there was a tiny clap of thunder on the lip of the quarry. It might have been caused by the sudden rushing of air into the vacuum caused by a very large dog becoming, for example, a small dog. The tiny popping noise was that followed might have been caused by one ear turning itself inside out. And I'll call him, said his master's voice, I'll call him 
Yes, said the girl. What are you going to call it? The hound waited. This was the moment. The naming. This would give it its purpose, its function, its identity. Its eyes glowed a dull red, even though they were a lot closer to the ground and it dribbled into the nettles. I'll call him Dog, said his master positively. It saves a lot of trouble, a name like that. The hell hand paused. <laughs> Deep in its diabolical canine brain, it knew something was wrong. <laughs> but it was nothing if not obedient, and its sudden, great, great sudden love of its master overcame all misgivings. Who was it to say what size it should be, anyway? It trotted down the slope to meet its destiny. Strange, though, it always wanted to jump at people, but now it realized that, that against all expectation, it wanted to wag its tail at the same time. <laughs> You said it was him, moaned Azaref abstractedly, picking the final lump of cream cake from his lapel. He licked his fingers clean. It was him, said Crowley. I mean, I should know, shouldn't I? Then something must, then something, someone else must be interfering. There isn't anyone else. There's just us, right? Good and evil, one side or the other. He thumped the steering wheel. You'd be amazed at the kind of things they could do to you down there, he said. I imagine they're very similar to the sort of things they could do to one up there, said the Zero Pal. Come off it. You, your lot gets ineffable mercy, said Crowley sourly. Yeah? Did you ever visit Gamora? Sure, said the demon. There's this great little tavern when you can get these terrific fermented date palm cocktails with nutmeg and crushed lemon grass. I mean, afterwards. Oh, as Zero Pal said, something must have happened in the hospital. It couldn't have. It was full of our people. Whose people? Said a third fell cold. My people, corrected Crowley. Well, not my people. You know, Satanists. He tried to say it dismissively. Apart from, of course, the fact that the world was an amazing, interesting place where they both wanted to enjoy for as long as possible. There were a few things that the two of them agreed on. But they did... There were, there were a few things that the two of them agreed on, but they did see eye to eye about some of those people for one reason or the other were inclined to worship the Prince of Darkness. Crowley always found them embarrassing. You couldn't actually be rude to them, but you couldn't help feeling about the, them the same way that, say, a Vietnam veteran would feel about someone who wore, wears combat gear to net neighborhood watch meetings. <sighs> Besides, they were always so depressingly enthusiastic. Take all that stuff for the inverted crosses and pentagrams and cockerels. It mystified most demons. It wasn't the least bit necessary. All you needed to become a Satanist was an effort of will. I mean, you could be one all your life without even knowing what a pentagram was, without ever seeing a dead cockerel other than as chicken marengo. Besides, some of the old Satanists, old style Satanists, tended in fact to be quite nice people. They mouthed words and went through the motions, just like the people they thought of as their op opposite numbers, and they went home and lived their lives of mild, unassuming mediocrity for the rest of the week, with never an unusually evil thought in their heads. As for the rest of it. There were people who called themselves Satanists who made Crowley squirm. It wasn't just the things they did, it was the way they blamed it all on hell. They'd come up with some stomach churning idea that no demon could have a thought uh, could have thought of in a thousand years, some dark and mindless unpleasantness that only a fully functioning human brain could see and then shout, The devil made me do it and get the sympathy of the court when the whole point was that the devil hardly made anyone ever do anything. He didn't have to. It was what some humans found hard to understand. Hell wasn't a major reservoir of evil any more than heaven, in Crowley's opinion, was a fountain of goodness. They're just sides in the great cosmic chess game, where you found the real McCoy, the real grace, and the real hot stopping evil was right inside the human mind. Huh, said Aziraphale, Satanist. I don't see how they could have messed that up, said Crowley. I mean, two babies, it's not exactly taxing, is it? He stopped. Through the mists of memory, he pictured a small nun who had struck him at the time as being remarkably loose-headed, even for a Satanist. And there had been someone else. Crowley vaguely recall recalled a pipe and a cardigan that kind of zigzag pattern that went out in style in 1938. A man with expectant father written all over him. There must have been a third baby. He told us, not a lot to go on, said the angel. We know the child must be alive, so, said Crowley, so how do we know? Well, if it turned up down there again, do you think I'd still be sitting here? Good point. So all we got to do is find it, said Crowley. Go through the hospital records. The Bentley's engine coughed into life and the car leapt forward, forcing his aircraft back in the seat. And then what, he said. And then we find the child. And then what? 
The ch angel shut his eyes as the car crabbed around the corner. I don't know. Good grief. I suppose. Get off the road, you clown. You people wouldn't consider. And the scooter you rode in on. Giving me asylum? I was going to ask you the same thing. Watch out for that pedestrian. It's on the street. It knows the risk it's taking. Said Crowley, easing the accelerating car between a parked car and a taxi and leaving the space, which would have been barely accepted even on the best credit card. <laughs> Watch the road. Watch the road. Where's this hospital anyway? Somewhere south of Oxford. As if I grabbed the dashboard. You can't do 90 miles an hour in central London. Crowley peered at the dial. Why not? He said. You'll get us killed. The zero fell hesitated. Well, inconveniently discorporated, he corrected, lamely relaxing a little. Anyway, you might kill other people. Crowley shrugged. The angel had never really come to grips with the 20th century and didn't realize it's perfectly possible to do 90 miles an hour down Oxford Street. You just arranged matters so that no one was in the way. And since everyone knew that it was impossible to do 90 miles an hour down Oxford Street, no one noticed. At least cars were better than horses. The internal combustion engine had been a, a blessing. A windfall for Crowley. Hey, Turtle, how you doing? Let me pop on my webcam right quick. And drink the water. <laughs> Thanks for that. Good lemon water. <laughs> Thank you for the follow, by the way. I, I saw that, that you followed me. I appreciate that. The only horses he could be seen riding on in business in the, on business in the old days were big black jobs with eyes like flames and hooves that struck sparks. That was day of a gift for, the, for a demon. Usually Crowley fell off. He wasn't much good with animals. Somewhere around Chiswick, Aziraphale scrabbled vaguely on the screen of tapes in the glove compartment. What's a velvet underground, he said. You wouldn't like it. Said Crowley. Oh, said the angel dismissively. Bebop. <sighs> Do you know, Zerifel, that if probably if a million human beings were asked to describe modern music, they wouldn't use the term bebop, said Crowley. Ah, this is more like it. Tchaikovsky, said Zerifel, opening a case and slotting the cassette to the plow punk. You won't enjoy it, said Side Crowley. It's been in the car for more than a fortnight. <laughs> a heavy bass beat began to thump through the Bentley as they sped past Heathrow. Aziraphale's brow furrowed. I don't recognize this, he said. What is it? It's Tychos Ty Ty <laughs> I can't pronounce it. Tchaikovsky's Another One Bites the Dust, said Crowley, closing his eyes as they went through the slow. Went through slow. To while away the time as they crossed the sleeping children's, they also listened to William Bird's We Are the Champions and Beethoven's I Want to Break Free. Neither were as good as Vaughn Williams' Fat Bottom Girls. Now, to kind of refresh your memory, the whole thing is that if, if Crowley has a tape in his car for more than two weeks, it turns into queen. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but... It is said that the devil has all the best tunes. It is brought, This is broadly true, but heaven has the best choreographers. The Oxfordshire plain stretched out to the west with the scattering of lights to mark the slumbering villages with honest yeomen were settling down to sleep after a long day's editorial direction, financial counseling, or software engineering. Up here on the hill, a few glowworms were lining up. The surveyor's the theodolite was one of the most direful symbols of the 20th century. Set up anywhere in the open countryside, it says, There will come road widening, yea, and 2,000 home estates in keeping with the essential character of the village. Executive de developments will be manifest. But not even the most conscientious surveyor surveys at midnight, and yet here the thing was, tripod legs deep in the turf. Not many theodolites have a hazel twig strapped to the top, either or crystal pendulums hanging from them in Celtic runes carved into the legs. The soft breeze flapped the cloak of the slim figure who was adjusting the knobs of the thing. It was quite a heavy cloak, sensibly waterproof with a warm lining. Most books on witchcraft will tell you that witches work naked. This is because most books on witchcraft are written by men. The young woman's name was Anathema Device. She was not astonishingly beautiful, but all her features considered an individual were extremely pretty, but the entirety of her face gave the impression that it had been put together hurriedly from stock without any reference to any plan. Probably the most suitable word is attractive, although people who knew what it meant could, and could spell it might add vivacious, although there was something very 50s about vivacious. So perhaps they wouldn't. Young women should not go alone on dark nights, even in Oxfordshire. 
but any probably maniac would have had more than his work cut out if he had accosted anything but device. She was a witch, after all, precisely because she was a witch, and therefore sensible. She put little faith in protective amulets and spells. She saved it all for a foot-long bread knife, which she kept in her belt. There's a reason why I was related to her. She sighted through the glass and made another adjustment. She muttered under her breath. Surveyors often mutter under their breath. They mutter things like, Soon to have a relief road through here faster than you say, Drake Robinson, or that's 3.5 meters, give or take a gnat's whisper. This was entirely different kind of muttering. Dark some night and shining moon muttered an anathema. East by south, by west by southeast, west by southwest. Got you. She picked up a folded ordnance survey map and held it in the torchlight. And then she produced a transparent ruler and her pencil and carefully drew a line across the map. It intersected another pencil line. She smiled, not because of anything was particularly amusing, but a tricky job had just been done well. She then collapsed the strange theater light strapped it to the back of the sit up and bag black bicycle leaning against the hedge, made sure the book was in the basket, and wheeled everything out to the misty lane. It was a very ancient bike with a frame apparently made of drain pipes. We do have an ad break in about five minutes. I will actually pause the reading when that happens. It had been built long before the invention of the three speed gear and possibly one only just after the invention of the wheel. But it was nearly all down here to the village, hair streaming in the wind, cloaked ballooning behind her like a sheet anchor. She let the two wheeled juggernaut accelerate ponderously through the warm air. At least there wasn't any traffic this time of night. The Bentley's engine went pink, pink as it cooled. Crowley's temper, on the other hand, was heating up. You said you saw it signposted, he said. Well, we flashed by so quickly. Anyway, I thought you had been here before. Eleven years ago, Crowley hurled the map back into the back seat and started the engine again. Perhaps we should ask someone, said his airfield. Oh, yes, said Crowley. We'll stop and ask the first person we see walking along a track in the middle of the night, shall we? He jerked the car and again roared out to the beach hung lane. There's something odd about this this area, said his airfield. Can't you feel it? What? Slow down a moment. The Bentley slowed again. Odd, muttered the angel. I keep getting these flashes of... He raised his hands to his temples. What? What? said Crowley. Aziraphale stared at Love, he said. Someone really loves this place. Pardon? There seems to be this great sense, sense of love. I can't put any, put any better than that, especially not to you. Do you mean like Crowley began? There was a whir, a scream, and a clunk. The car stopped. Aziraphale blinked and lowered his hands and gingerly opened the door. You've hit someone, he said. No, I haven't, said Crowley. Someone's hit me. They got out behind the Bentley up bicycle lane in the road. It's front wheel bent. Front wheel bent into a credible Mobius shape, its back wheel clicking ominously to a standstill. Let there be light, said Aziraphale. A pale blue glow filled the lane from the ditch beside them. Someone said, how the hell did you do that? The light vanished. Do what? said Aziraphale guiltily. Ugh, another voice sounded muzzy. I think I hit my head on something. Crowley glared at the long metallic streak on the Bentley's glossy paintwork and dimple in the bumper. The dimple popped back into shape. The paint healed. Up you get, young lady, said the angel, hauling anything out of the bracket. No bones broken. It was a statement, not a hope. There had been a minor fracture, but Aziraphale couldn't resist an opportunity to do good. You didn't have any lights, she began. Nor did you, said Crowley guiltily. Fair as fair. Doing a spot of astronomy, were we? Said Aziraphale, setting the biker upright. Various things clattered out of its front basket. He pointed to the battered theodolite. No, said anything. I mean, yes. And look what you've done to poor old Phaeton. I'm sorry, said Aziraphale. My bicycle's been all to... Amazingly resilient, these old machines, said the angel brightly handing it to her. The front wheel gleamed in the moonlight as perfectly as round as one of the circles of hell. She stared at it. Well, since that's sorted out, said Crowley, perhaps it'd be best if we just got on our... Or you wouldn't happen to know way to lower tide field, would you? Anathema was still staring at her bicycle. She was almost certain that it hadn't had a little saddlebag with a puncture repair kit when she set out. It's just down the hill, she said. This is my bike, isn't it? Oh, certainly, said the Zerfell, wonderfully overdone things. Uh, only, I'm sure fate never had, never had a pump. The angel looked guilty again. But there's a place for one, he said helplessly. Two little looks. Just down the hill, you said, said Crowley, nudging the angel. I think perhaps I must have knocked my head, said the girl. Would offer you a lift, of course, said Crowley quickly, but there's nowhere for the bike. Except the lug- luggage rack, said the Zerfell. The Bentley hasn't... <sighs> oh, huh. The angel scrambled the spilled contents of the bike's basket back into the back seat and helped the stunned girl in after them. One does not, he said to Crowley, pass back on the other side. Your one may not. This one does. We have got other things to do, you know. Crowley glared at the new luggage rack. It had tartan straps. The bicycle lifted itself up and tied itself firmly in place. Then Crowley got in. Where do you live, my dear? Zerophel oozed. 
My bike didn't have lights either. Well, it did, but they're the sort you put those double batteries in. They went moldies, and I took them off. So then I think it, she'd go out at Crowley. I have a bread knife, you know. She said, somewhere. Aziraphale looked shocked at the implication. Madam, I assure you. Crowley switched on the lights. He didn't need to see by it, but it made the other humans on the road less nervous. And then he put the car in again and drove sedately down the hill. The road came out from under the trees and after a few hundred yards reached the outskirts of the middle-sized village. It had a familiar feel to it. It had been 11 years, but this place definitely rang a distant bell. Is there a hospital around here, he said, run by nuns? And the theme shrugged. Don't think so, she said. There are large places, Tadfield Manor. I don't know what goes on there. Divine planning, muttered Crowley under his breath. And gears, said Anathema. My, my bike didn't have gears. I'm sure my bike didn't have gears. Crowley leaned across to the angel. Oh, Lord, heal this bike. He whispered sarcastically. I'm sorry, I just got carried away. Hissed Aziraphale. Tartan straps. Tartan is stylish. Crowley groaned. On those occasions when the angel had managed to get his mind to the 20th century, it always gravitated to 1950. All right, I'm going to pause here for the ad break and also take a quick, quick drink break. We'll have a minute and a half ad break shortly. I do apologize for the interruption in the reading. But sadly, it is a uh, necessary evil. And, and you might hear odd dog noises. That's uh, Thorn's Dog River. She is hanging out on my bed. <laughs> we have a swoosh. <laughs> <laughs> River, you're being very talkative. <laughs> go get go get your dad and get him to get you up. <laughs> you can drop me off here, said anything from the back seat. Our pleasure being the angel. And as soon as the car had stopped, he had the back door open. It was bound like an old aged retainer welcoming the young master back to the plantation. Anathema gathered her things together and stepped out as haughtily as possible. And here's the ad break for a minute, a minute and a half. Now, uh, during the ad break, uh, we can take a little breather, um, get more cuddly if you'd like, you know, pull you up a blanket if you have air conditioning, because I know this is kind of warm weather. But try to snuggle down, have your favorite beverage. This is a nice time to self care if you'd like. Um, I provide a lot of this uh, for my community. It's it's basically just a time to like take your time and and just vibe. Um, I do have to a little happen to reminder that I appreciate all the follows. I appreciate our lurkers, and I also appreciate uh, everything everybody does for you know for themselves, for the community, what have you. And I thank you all for being here and listening to me read this this story. Like I said, our next book will be the first book in the Dresden Files series. And trust me, we're a long way away from being finished for this book. Because <laughs> this, uh, Wednesday has a lot of content. So, <laughs> I am going to probably, I, I think, let's see. Yeah, we've got quite a few pages. I'm basically going to read Wednesday, today, Thursday, next time. Uh, welcome back from the ad break, and we shall continue. Or is it in the old, in the old saying... When you hear the beep, turn the page. Beep. <laughs> she was quite sure neither of the two men had gone around to the back of the car, but the bike was unstrapped and leaning against the gate. There was definitely something very weird about them, she decided. As Zerophel bound again, so glad to have been of assistance, he said. Thank you, said Anathema icily. Can we get on, said Crowley. Good night, miss. Get in, Angel. Ah, well, that explained it. She'd been perfectly safe after all. She watched the car disappear toward the center of the village and wheeled the bike up the path to the cottage. She hadn't bothered to lock it. She was sure that Agnes would have mentioned that she was going to be burgled. She was always very good at personal things like that. She had rented the cottage furnished, which meant the actual furniture was a special sort you find in these circumstances, and it had probably been left out for the dustman by the local war on watch shop. It didn't matter. She didn't expect to be here long. If Agnes was right, she wouldn't be anywhere long, Not, no, nor would anyone else. She spread her maps and things out on the ancient table under the kitchen solitary light bulb. What was, it? what had she learned? Nothing much. She decided probably it was at the north end of the village, but she had suspected that anyway. If you got too close, to the signal swamped you. If you were too far away, you couldn't get an accurate fix. It was infuriating. 
the answer must be in the book somewhere. The trouble was that in order to understand the predictions, you had to be able to think like a half-crazed, highly intelligent 17th century witch with a mind like a crossword puzzle dictionary. Other members of the family had said that Agnes made things obscure to conceal them from the understanding of outsiders, and Athena, who suspected she could occasionally think like Agnes, had probably decided that was because Agnes was a bloody-minded old bitch with a mean sense of humor. <laughs> She'd not even... She didn't have the book. Anathema stared in hard things on the table, the maps, the homemade divinatory at the air of the light, the thermos that had contained hot bulbs of the torch, the rectangle of empty air where the prophecy should have been. She had lost it. But that was ridiculous. One of the things Agnes was always very specific about was what happened to the book. She snatched up the torch and ran from the house. A feeling like, oh, the opposite you feel when you have when you're having when you say things like this feels spooky, said Israel. That's what I mean. I never say things like this feels spooky, said Crowley. I'm all for spooky. A cherished feel, said Aziraphale desperately. Nope, can't sense a thing, said Crowley with forced jolliness. You're just oversensitive. It's my job, said Aziraphale. Angels can't be oversensitive. I expect people around here like living here and you're just picking it up. Never picked up anything like this in London, said Aziraphale. Well, there you are then. That proves my point, said Crowley. And this is the place. I remember the stone lions on the gateposts. The Bentley's headlights lit up the groves of overgrown rhododendrons that lined the drive. The tires crunched over gravel. It's a bit early in the morning to be calling on nuns, said Deserfeld doubtfully. Nonsense. Nuns are up and about at all hours, said Crowley. It's probably compliment, unless it's, unless that's a slimming aid. Oh, cheap. Very cheap, said the angel. There's really no need for that sort of thing. Oh, don't get defensive. I told you. These were summer hours. Black nuns. Hey, Phantom, how you doing? Boop. Let me give you a quick shout out. All, all the people do all the things. Don't get defensive. I told you there's some. These were some of ours. Black nuns. We didn't. We need a hospital close to the air base. You see, you've lost me there. You don't think American diplomats' wives usually give birth in little religious hospitals in the middle of nowhere, do you? It all had to seem to happen naturally. There's an air base at Lord Tadfield. She went there for the opening. Things started to happen. Base hospital not ready. Our man said there's a place just down the road. And there we were. Rather good organization. Except for one or two minor details, said Aziraphale smug. But it nearly worked. Snapped Crowley, feeling like you should stick it up for the old firm. <sighs> you see, evil always contains the seeds of its own destruction, said the angel. It is ultimately negative and therefore encompasses its downfall, even in its moments of apparent triumph. No matter how grandiose or how well planned, how apparently foolproof and evil planned, the inherent sinfulness by, will, by any by definition, rebound upon its instigators. No matter how apparently successful it may seem, the way seem upon the way at the end it will wreck itself. It will founder upon the rocks of iniquity and sink head first to vanish without trace into the seas of oblivion. Crowley has considered this. Nah, he said at last. For my money, it was just average incompetence. Hey. He whistled under his breath. The gravel forecourt in front of the manor was crowded with cars, and they weren't none cars. The Bentley was, as if anything, outclassed. A lot of the cars had GT or Turbo in their names and phone aerials on their roofs. They were nearly all less than a year old. Crowley's hands itched. Zerafel Hill bicycles with broken bones. He's longed to steal a few radios, let down some tires, and that sort of thing. He resisted it. Well, well, he said, in my days, nuns were packed for to a Morse traveler. This can't be right, said Azur. Oh, perhaps they've gone private, said Crowley. Or you've got the wrong place. It's the right place, I tell you. Come on. They got out of the car. 30 seconds later, someone shot both of them with incredible accuracy. So how are you doing, Phantom? I'm sorry. In the midst of the second portion of reading Good Omens to everybody. Just vibing. This is a good place to vibe. Uh, this is the second session of this. Um, I do need to sit down and actually post these to YouTube too. I haven't had a chance to. <laughs> Bad me. <laughs> but I do have the first one up uh, as a um, highlight if you'd care if you want to take take a watch. I'm doing this crocheting art 
you know, and, and writing all on the same stream. <laughs> so, if there's one thing that Mary Hodges, formerly the local crashes, was good at, it was attempting to obey orders. She liked orders. They made the world a simpler place. What she wasn't good at was change. She'd really liked the chattering order. She'd made friends for the first time. She'd had a room of her own for the first time. And, of course, she knew that it was engaged in things that might be, from certain viewpoints, be considered bad. But Mary Hodges had seen quite a lot of life in 30 years and had no illusions about what most of the human race had to do in order to make it from one week to the next. Besides, the food was good and you got to meet interesting people. The order, such as what was left of it, had moved after the fire. After all, their sole purpose in existing had been fulfilled. They went their separate ways. She hadn't gone. She'd rather like the manor, and she said someone ought to stay and see it was properly repaired, because you just couldn't trust workmen these days, unless you were on top of them the whole time, in a manner of speaking. This meant breaking her vows, but Mother Superior said this was all right, nothing to worry about. Breaking vows was perfectly okay in a black sisterhood, and it would be all the same in a hundred years' time, or rather eleven years' time. So if it gave her any pleasure, here were the deeds and an address for any man unless it came in long brown envelopes with windows on the front. Then something very strange happened to her, left alone in the rambling building, working from one of the few undamaged rooms, arguing with men with cigarette stubs behind the ears and plaster dust on their trousers, the kind of pocket calculator that comes up with a different answer if the sums involved are in used notes. She discovered something she never knew existed. She discovered under layers of silliness, eagerness to please, Mary Hodges. She found it quite easy to interpret builders' estimates and do VAT calculations. She got some books from the library and found finance to be both interesting and uncomplicated. She had stopped reading the kind of women's magazine that talks about romance and knitting and started reading the kind of women's magazine that talks about orgasms. Yes, I said that word on, on stream. So, don't at me. <laughs> but apart from making a mental note to have one, if ever the occasion presented itself, <laughs> she dismissed them as only romance and knitting in a new form. So she started reading the kind of magazine that talked about mergers. After much thought, she bought a small home computer from an amusing and condescending young dealer in Norton. After a crowded weekend, she took it back, not as he thought when she walked back to the shop to have a plug put on it, but because it didn't have a 387 coprocessor. Remember, this was written in 1990. That, that bit he understood. He was a dealer, after all, and could understand quite long words. But after that, the conversation rapidly went downhill from his point of view. Mary Hodges produced yet more magazines. Most of them had the term PC somewhere in their title, and many of them, many of them had articles and reviews that she had circled carefully in red ink. She read about new women. She had never realized she had been an old woman. <laughs> but after some thought, she decided that titles like that were all, were all one with romance and the knitting and the orgasms, and the really important thing was to be yourself just as hard as you could. See? There you go. There, there's PSA, right? <laughs> <clears throat> She'd always been inclined to dress in black and white. All she needed to do was raise the hemlines, raise the heels, and leave off the wimple. It was while leafing through a magazine one day that she learned that around the country there was apparently an insatiable demand for commodious buildings and spacious grounds run by people who understood the needs of the business community. The following day, she went out and ordered some stationery in the name of the Tadfield Manor Conference and Management, Tra Management Training Center, reasoning that by the time it had been printed, she'd know all that was necessary to know about running such places. The ads went out the following week. It had turned out to be an overwhelming success because Mary Hodges realized early in her new career as herself that management training didn't have to mean sitting people down in front of an unreliable slide projector. Firms expected far more than that these days. She provided it. Let me take another drink real quick. <laughs> I will say this about this book. It doesn't hold back. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd forgot about that bit, to be honest. Curly sank down with his back against the statue. Zeriphal had already toppled backwards into a rhododendron bush, a dark stain spreading across his coat. Crowley found dampness suffusing his own shirt. This was ridiculous. The last thing he needed now was to get killed. It would require all sorts of explanations. They didn't hand out new bodies just like that. They always wanted to know what you'd done with the old one. It was like trying to get a new pen for a particularly bloody-minded stationery department. He lifted his hand in disbelief. Demons have, ha have to be able to see in the dark. And he could see that his hand was yellow. He was bleeding yellow. Gingerly, he tasted a finger. Oh, that's... Then he crawled over to a zero found check the angel shirt. If the stain on it was blood, something had gone very wrong with biology. 
Oh, that stung. Well, fallen angel got me right under the ribs. Yes, but do you normally bleed blue? Said Crowley. As Zerifel's eyes opened his right hand, patted his chest. He sat up, went to the same crude forensic self-examination as Crowley. Paint, he said. Crowley nodded. Where are they playing at? Said Zerifel. I don't know, said Crowley, but I think it's called Silly Boogers. <laughs> And that's where I got it. If you ever hear me say, you know, Plumley's playing at Silly Burgers, that's where I got that from. His tone suggested that he could play too and do it better. It was a game. It was tremendous fun. Nigel Tompkins, head of assistant, assistant head of purchasing, squirmed through the undergrowth, his mind aflame with some more the more memorable scenes of some of the better Clint Eastwood movies. And to think you believed management training was going to go was going to be boring too. There had been a lecture. But it had been about the paint guns and all the things you should never do with them, and Tompkins had looked at the fresh young faces of his rival trainees, and, and as to a man, they resolved to do them all if there was half a chance of getting away with it. If people told you business was a jungle and then put a gun in your hand, then it was pretty obvious to Tompkins that they weren't expecting to simply aim for the shirt. What it was all about was the corporate head hanging over your fireplace. Anyway, it was rumored that someone over in United Consolidated had done his promotion prospects a considerable amount of good to, by the anonymous application of a high-speed air full of paint to an immediate superior, causing the latter to complain of little ringing noises in important meetings and eventually be replaced on medical grounds. Yeah, because when, when you play with paint guns, I don't know if anyone here has ever done the paint gun thing, but there are certain places you don't shoot people with them. Because <laughs> as safe as they claim these things to be, I have seen, I have, I've been around guys that have done that whole thing. They leave bruises that even some of the WWE wrestlers went at. So, <laughs> not for the faint of heart. And there were his fellow, fellow trainees, fellow sperms to switch metaphors, all struggling forward in the knowledge that there could only ever be one chairman of Industrial Holdings, Holdings PLC. And that job would probably go to the biggest prick. <laughs> See what I mean about that? I'll help you back. Of course, some girl with a clipboard from personnel had told them that the courses they were going on were just to establish leadership potential, group cooperation, and initiative, and so on. The trainees had tried to avoid one another's faces. It worked quite well so far. The bike water canoeing had taken care of Johnstone, punctured eardrum, and the mountain climbing wells had done for Whitaker, groin strain. Tompkins thumbed another paint pellet into the gun and muttered business mantras to himself. Do unto others before they do unto you. Kill or be killed. Either shit or get out of the kitchen. See, that's where I got it from. Survival of the fittest. Make my day. <laughs> Don't ask me why he says either shit or get out of the kitchen. I've never understood that thought. <laughs> never. <laughs> he crawled a little nearer to the figures by the statue. They didn't seem to have noticed him. When the available cover ran out, he took a deep breath and leapt to his feet. Okay, douchebags, grab some sca- Ooh. Where one of the figures had been, there was something dreadful. He blacked out. Crowley restored himself to his favorite shape. I hate having to do that. Remember? I'm always afraid I forget how to change back. And he can ruin a good suit. I think the maggots were a bit off the top myself, said Azarifo, but without much rancor. Angels had certain moral standards to maintain, and so unlike Crowley, he preferred to buy his clothes rather than wish them into being from raw firmament. And the shirt had been quite expensive. I mean, just look at it, he said. I'll never get the stain out. Miracle in a way, said Crowley, scanning the undergrowth for any more management trainees. Yes, but I'll always know the stain was there, you know, deep down, I mean said the angel. He picked up the gun, turned it over in his hands. I've never seen one of these before, he said. There was a pinging noise in the statue beside the lost ear. Let's not hang around, said Crowley. He wasn't alone. This is a very odd gun, you know. Very strange. I thought your side disapproved the gun, said Crowley. He took the gun from the angel's plump hand and sighted down along the stubby barrel. Current thinking for favors them, said Zarephel. They then wait to moral argument in the right hands, of course. Yeah? Crowley snaked the hand over the middle. That's all right, then. Come on. He dropped the gun on the recumbent form of Tompkins and marched away across the damp lawn. The front door of the manor was unlocked. The pair of them walked through unheeded. Some plump young men in army fatigue, spired with paint, were drinking cocoa out of mugs in what had once been the sisters' refectory, and one or two had gave them a cheery wave. Something like a hotel reception desk now occupied one end of the hall. It had a quietly competent look. Aziraphale gazed at the board on the aluminum easel beside it. 
I swear to you, I was so tempted to read the aluminium. I, I, it's the British thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sure when they wrote it, I'm sure that's what they thought in their head when they wrote it. <laughs> in the little plastic letters let into the black, black fabric of the board with the words, August 20 to 21st, United Holdings, Holdings PLC Initiative Combat Course. Meanwhile, Crowley had picked up a pamphlet from the desk. It showed glossy pictures of the manor with special references to its jacuzzis and indoor heated swimming pool. Damn, that sounds good right about now. And on the back was some sort of map that conference centers always have, pardon me, which makes use of careful misscaling to suggest that it's handy for every motorway exit in the nation while carefully leaving out the labyrinth of country lanes that in fact surround the place for miles on every side. <sighs> Wrong place, said the Zerfell. No. Wrong time, then. Yes. Crowley leafed through the book, but hoped that any clue. Perhaps it was too much to hope the chattering order would still be here. After all, they'd done their bit. He has softly, perhaps, probably they'd gone to the darkest America or something to convert the Christians. But he read on anyway. Sometimes this little sort of leaflet had a little historical bit because the kind of companies that hired places like this for a weekend of interactive personnel analysis or a conference on the strategic marketing dynamic liked to feel like they were strategically interacting in the very building, give or take a couple of com complete rebuildings, a civil war, or two major fires that some Elizabethan financier had endowed as a plague hospital. Not that he was actually expecting a sentence like, until 11 years ago, the manor was used as a convent by an order of satanic nuns who weren't, in fact, at all that good at it, really, but you never know. A plump man wearing desert camouflage and holding a polystyrene cup of coffee wandered up to them. Who's winning, he said, chumily. Young Evanson of Forward Planning caught me in the right zinger on the elbow, you know. We're all going to lose, said Crowley absently. There was a burst of firing from the grounds, not the snap and zing of pellets, but the full-throated crackle of aerodynamically shaped bits of lead traveling extremely fast. There was an answering stutter. The redundant warriors stared on one, stared one on another. The a further burst took out a rather ugly Victorian stained glass window beside the door and stitched a row of holes in the flash of my Crowley's head. Aziraphale grabbed his arm. What the hell is it? He said. Crowley smiled like a snake. Nigel Tompkins had come to, to with a mild headache and a vaguely empty space in his recent memory. He was not to know that the human brain, when faced with the sight of too, too terrible to contemplate, is remarkably good at scabbing it over with forced forgetfulness, so he put it down to a pellet strike on the head. He was vaguely aware that his gun was somewhat heavier, but in his mildly bemused state he did not realize why until some time after he pointed at trainee manager Norma Weathered from internal audit and pulled the trigger. I don't see why you're so shocked, said Crowley. He wanted a real gun. Every desire in his head was for a real gun. But you've turned him loose on all those unprotected people, said Aziraphale. Oh, no, said Crowley. Not exactly. Fair's fair. The contingent of financial planning were lying flat on their faces in what had been once been the ha-ha, although they weren't very amused. I always said you couldn't trust those people in person, said the deputy financial manager. The bastards the shot pinged off the wall above him. He crawled hurriedly over to the little group clustered around the fallen weathered. How does it look, he said. The assistant head of wages turned a haggard face toward him. Pretty bad, he said. The bullet went through nearly all of them. Access, Barclay, Barclay card, diners, the lot. It was only the American Express gold that stopped it, said weathered. They looked in mute horror at the spectacle of a credit card bullet with a bullet hole nearly all the way through it. Why'd they do it, said a wages officer. The head of internal audit opened his mouth to say something reasonable and didn't. Everyone had a point where they crack, and his had just been hit with a spoon. Twenty years on the job, he'd wanted to be a graphic designer, but the careers masters hadn't heard of that. Twenty years of double-checking form BF-18, twenty years of cranking the bloody hand calculator, and even when even the people in Ford Planning had computers. And now, for reasons unknown, but possibly due to reorganization and a desire to do away with all the expense of early retirement, they were shooting at him with bullets. The armies of paranoia marched behind his eyes. He looked down at his own gun through the mists of rage and bewilderment. He saw that it was bigger and blacker than it had been when it was issued to him. It felt heavier, too. He aimed it at a bush nearby and watched a stream of bullets blow the bush into oblivion. Oh, so that was their game. Well, someone had to win. He looked at his men. Okay, guys, he said, let's get the bastards. The way I see it, said Crowley, no one has to pull the trigger. 
He gave Zerf a bright burr grin. Come on, he said. Let's have a look around while everyone's busy. Bullock streaked across the night. Jonathan Parker, person in his section, was wriggling through the bushes when one of them put an arm around his neck. Nigel Tompkins spat a cluster of rhododendron leaves out of his mouth. Down there it's company law. He hissed through mud and crusted features. But up here it's me. That was a pretty low trick, said Aziraphale, as they strode along empty corridors. What did I do? What did I do? Said Crowley, pushed open doors at random. There are people out there shooting one another. Well, that's just it, isn't it? They're doing it themselves. It's what they really wanted to do. I just assisted them. They give us a microcosm of the universe. Free will for everyone. Effable, right? Aziraphale glared. Oh, all right, said Crowley registrly. No one's actually going to get killed. They're all going to have miraculous escapes. It wouldn't be any fun otherwise. Aziraphale relaxed. You know, Crowley, he said, beaming. I've always said that deep down inside, you're really quiet. All right, all right, Crowley snapped. Tell the whole blessed world, why don't you? After a while, loose allowances began to merge. Most of the financial departments found they had interest in common, and sell their differences and ganged up on forward planning. When the first police car arrived, 16 bullets from a variety of directions hit it in the radiator before it got halfway up the drive. Two more took out its radio antenna, but they were too late. Too late. Thank you for that snoozing the ad. I appreciate it. Mary Hodges was just putting down the phone when Crowley opened her office door. It must be terrorists, she snapped her poachers. She peered at the pair of them. You are, you are the police, aren't you, she said. Crowley saw her eyes begin to widen. Like all demons, he had a good memory for faces. Even after ten years, the loss of a wimp on the addition of rather, some rather severe makeup, he snapped his fingers. She settled back in her chair, her face becoming a blank and amiable mask. There was no need for that, said Aziraphale. Good. Crowley glanced at his watch. Morning, ma'am, he said in a sing song voice. We're just a couple of supernatural entities. We were just wondering if you might help us with the whereabouts of the notorious son of Satan. He smiled coldly at the angel. I'll wake her up again, shall I? And mean, you can say it. Oh, since you put it like that, said the angel slowly. Sometimes the old ways are best, said Crowley. He turned to the impressive woman. Were you a nun here eleven years ago, he said. Yes, said Mary. There, said Crowley to Zero. See, I knew I wasn't wrong. Luck of the devil, muttered the angel. And your name was then was Sister Talkative or something. Loquacious, said Mary Hodges in a hollow voice. And do you recall an incident involving the switching a newborn baby, said Crowley. Mary Hodges hesitated. When she did speak, it was through, the, as though memories that had been scabbed over were being disturbed for the first time in years. Yes, she said. Is there any possibility that switch could have gone wrong in some way? I do not know. Crowley thought for a bit. You must have had records, he said. There's always records. Everyone has records these days. He glanced proudly at the surf. It's one of my better ideas. Oh, yes, said Mary Hodges. And where are they? said Aziraphale sweetly. There was a fire just after the birth. <sighs> Crowley groaned through his hands in the air. That hat was Haster, probably, he said. It's his style. Can you believe those guys? I bet he thought he was being really clever. Do you recall any tales about the other child? said Aziraphale. Yes, please tell me. He had lovely little tozy buzzies. Oh. And he was very sweet, said Mod Mary Hodges wistfully. There was the sound of a siren outside, abruptly broken off as the bullet hit it. As there fell nudge Crowley. Get a move on, he said. We're going to be knee-deep in police in any moment. And I will, of course, be morally obliged to assist them in their inquiries. He thought for a moment. Perhaps she can remember if there were any women giving birth that night. And there was a sound of running feet downstairs. Stop them, said Crowley. We need more time. Any more miracles and most realists want to start getting noticed by up there, said Azurifa. If you really want Gabrielle or someone wondering why 40 policemen have gone to sleep. Okay, said Crowley. That's it. That's it. It was worth a try. Let's get out of here. In 30 seconds, you will wake up, said Azurifa to the entranced ex nun. You will have a, will have had a lovely dream about whatever you like best. And yes, yes, said Crowley. Now, can we go? No one noticed them leaving. The police were too busy hurting in. Forty adrenaline drunk fighting man management trainees. Three police vans had gouged tracks in the lawn. And a zero found my crowdy back up for the first of the ambulances. But then the Bentley swished into the night. Behind them, the summer house and gazebo were already ablaze. We've really left that poor woman in a dreadful situation, so they <laughs> you think? Said Crowley, trying to hit a hedgehog and missing. Bookings will double, you'll mark my words. If she plays her cards right, sorts out all the waivers, ties up all the legal bits, initiative training with real guns, they'll form cues. Why are you always so cynical? I said, because it's my job. 
They drove in silence for a while, and Aziraphale said, You'd think he'd show up, wouldn't you? You'd think we could detect him in some way. He won't show up, not for us. Protective camouflage, he won't even know it, but his powers will keep him hidden from prying occult forces. Occult forces? You and me, explained Crowley. I'm not a cult, said Aziraphale. Angels aren't a cult, we're ethereal. Whatever, snapped Crowley, too worried to argue. Is there some other way of locating him? Crowley shrugged. Search me, he said. How much experience do you think I've got in these matters? Armageddon only happens once, you know. They don't let you go around again until you get it right. Angel stared at the rushing hedgerows. It all seems so peaceful, he said. How do you think it will happen? Well, thermonuclear extinction has always been very popular. Although, I must say, the big boys are being quite polite to each other at the moment. Asteroid strikes, said Azurfo. Quite the fashion these days, I understand. Striking the Indian Ocean, great big cloud of dust and vapor. Goodbye to all the higher life forms. Wow, said Crowley, taking care to exceed the speed limit every little bit helped. Doesn't bear thinking about, does it, said Azurfo gloomily. All the higher life forms side the way just like that. Terrible. Nothing but dust and fundamentalists. That was nasty. Sorry, I couldn't resist it. They stared at the road. Maybe some terrorists? Aziraphale began. Not one of ours, said Crowley. Or ours, said Aziraphale, although ours are freedom fighters, of course. I'll tell you what, said Crowley, scorching rubber on the Tadfield bypass. Cars on the table time. I'll tell you ours if you tell me yours. All right, you first. No, no, you first, but you're a demon. Yes, but a demon of my word, I should hope. Aziraphale named five political leaders. Crowley named six. Three names appeared on both lists. See, said Crowley, it's just like I've always said. They're cunning boogers, humans. You can't trust them an inch. But I don't think any of ours had any bleak plans of it, said Aziraphale. It's just minor acts of ter political protest. He corrected. Ah, said Crowley bitterly. You mean none of this cheap, mass-produced murder, just personal service, every book individually fired by skilled craftsmen. Aziraphale didn't rise to it. What are we going to do now? Try and get some sleep. You don't need sleep. I don't need sleep. Evil never sleeps and virtue is ever vigilant. Evil in general, maybe this specific part of it has gotten to the habit of getting its head down occasionally. He stared into the headlights. The time would come soon when sleep would be right out of the question. When those below found out he personally had lost the Antichrist, they'd probably dig out all those reports he'd done on the Spanish Inquisition and try them out on him, one at a time and then all, then all together. He rummaged in the glove part, fumbled the tape at random, and slotted the player a little music with bills above. Has a devil put aside for me? For me? For me, murmured Crowley. His expression looked, went blank for a moment. Then he gave a strangled scream and wrenched the, the on-off knob. Of course, we might be able to get a human to find him, said Aziraphale thoughtfully. What? said Crowley distractedly. Humans are good at finding other humans. They've been doing it for thousands of years, and the child is human. Well, as well as, you know, he'd be hidden from us, but other humans might be able to um, sense it, perhaps, or spot things he wouldn't think of. It wouldn't work. He's the Antichrist. He's got this sort of automatic defense, hasn't he? Even if he doesn't know it. It won't even let people suspect him. Not yet. Not till it's ready. Suspicion will slide off him like like whatever it is water slides off of. He finished lamely. Got any better ideas? Got one single better idea, said Aziraphale? Nope. Right then. It could work. Don't tell me you haven't got any front organizations you can use. I know I have. We can see if they can pick up the trail. Well, what could they do that we couldn't do? Well, for a start, they wouldn't get people to shoot one another. They wouldn't hypnotize respectable women. They, okay, okay, but it hasn't got a snowball chance in hell. Believe me, I know, but I can't think of anything better. Crowley turned on the motorway and headed for London. I have a special network of agents, said Aziraphale after a while. Spread across the country, discipline force. I'll see them searching. Or, um, I have something similar, Crowley admitted. You know how it is. You never know when they might come in handy. We'd better alert them. Do you think they ought to work together? Crowley shook his head. I don't think that'd be a good idea, he said. They're not very sophisticated, politically speaking. Then we'll each contact our own people and see what they can manage. Got to be worth a try, I suppose, said Crowley. It's not like I've got lots of other work to do, God knows. His forehead creased from it. They slapped the steering wheel triumphantly. Ducks, he shouted. Nah. <laughs> what? That's what water slides off of. Aziraphale took a deep breath. Just drive the car, please. They drove back through the dawn while the cassette player played J.S. Bach's Mass and B minor vocals by F. Mercury. Crowley liked the city in the early morning. Its population consisted almost entirely of people who had proper jobs to do and real reasons for being there, as opposed to the unnecessary millions who trailed in after 8 a.m. The streets were more or less quiet. There were double yellow, no parking lines in the narrow road outside Aziraphale's bookshop, but they immediately rolled back on themselves when Bentley pulled into the curb. 
Well, okay, he said, is there if I've got his coat from the back seat? We'll keep in touch, okay? What's this? Said, is there if I'll hold up a brown oblong? Crowley squinted at it. A book? I said, he said, not mine. Is there if I'll turn a few of the yellow pages? Tiny bibliophilic fellows rang in the back of his mind. It must have belonged to that young lady, he said slowly. We ought to have got her address. Look, I'm in enough trouble as it is. I don't want to get it about that I go around returning people's property to them, said Crowley. As if I reached the title page, it was probably a good job Crowley couldn't see his expression. I suppose you could always send it to the post office there, said Crowley. If you feel you, you must, address it to the mad woman with the bicycle. Never trust a woman who gets funny names to means of transport. Yes, yes, certainly, said the angel. He fumbled for his keys, dropped them on the pavement, picked them up, dropped them again, heard to the shop door. We'll be in touch then, shall we? Crowley called after him. Is there if I pause in the act of turning the key? What? He said, oh, yo, yes, yes, fine, jolly good. And he slammed the door. Right, mumbled Crowley, suddenly feeling all alone. We have an ad break starting in about 20 seconds. I'm going to take a quick pause with the guys. Let's see. I'm just seeing how much more we got. We really don't have a whole lot more, so... Uh, what I'm planning on doing uh, after this, I'm probably going to swap over to uh, my time at Porsche because I've actually been doing some work on that. It's a very cozy game. The only reason I haven't done anything with Dreamlight Valley on stream or won't be for a while because I'm kind of running out of content for that. So I'm going to be turning into some other games for coziness. My time at Porsche is, is actually working out really well. Um... There's also going to be upcoming pretty soon Age of Mythology, so I'm hoping beyond hope that I'll be able to do that. Um, I appreciate everybody hanging out and kind of vibing with me today. I know it's a very cozy stream, very cal you know calm and laid back. Um, hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I was taking notes of some things that had gone on earlier. <laughs> and we have an ad break for a minute and a half. We do apologize for that. It is a necessary evil. Uh, right after the, we end today, like I said, I have plans. Now, sadly, I will not be streaming next Wednesday unless I cut my shifts again. Um, so our reading will take place. Our next reading will probably take place two, two weeks from today. Uh, because I will be off that Wednesday, I think. I'm going to have to have my, my Monday shift um, moved around a bit. Because uh, a week from this coming Monday is the uh, protest that I want to attend. And technically I'm not supposed to work that day. Out of protest. <laughs> so I can't very well sit down and... Uh, I, I can't exactly clock in and sit down and not work. <laughs> so I was going to talk to Laura and see if I can get her to move the shift at least over one day at least. If not, she can cut it completely. I mean, at this point, I don't care anymore. I did a, apply to a bunch of jobs. And, uh, that, and so hopefully something of that will come out of it. And by the way, just a little uh, FYI reminder. If you're enjoying the content and not already following, please hit that follow button. I would really appreciate it. I am so close to 300 followers. And if, you, and if you're already following and would like to pass this on to a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend, here I am back again. So I kind of robbed that from someone else. I hate to say it. But anyway, we're back from the eye break. Welcome back. Torchlight flicked in the lanes. The trouble with trying to find a brown covered book among brown leaves and brown water at the bottom of, of a ditch of brown earth is in the brown well and grayish light of dawn is that you couldn't. It wasn't there. And Athena tried every method she could to think of. There was a methodical quartering of the ground. There was a slapdash poking at the bracken by the roadside. There was a nonchalant sidling up to it and looking out of the side of her eye. She even tried the one which every romantic nerve in her body insisted should work, which consists of theatrically giving up, sitting down, and letting her glance fall naturally on a patch of earth, which, if she had been in any decent narrative, should have contained the book. It didn't. Which meant, as she fell along, it was the probably back of the car belonging to two consenting cycle repairmen. She could feel generations of Agnes Nutter's descendants laughing at her. Even if those two men were honest enough to want to return it, they'd hardly go all the trouble finding a cottage they'd barely seen in the dark. The only hope was that they wouldn't know what it was they got. 
Aziraphale, like many Soho merchants who specialized in hard to find books for the disconcerting connoisseur, had a background. But what was in there was far more esoteric than anything normally found inside a shrink wrap bag for the customer who knows what he wants. He was particularly proud of his books of prophecy, first editions usually, and every one was signed. He had got Robert Nixon, and here's a footnote, a 16th century half-wit not related to any U.S. president. A Martha the Gypsy, and Ignatius Sibylla, and old Otwell Binns. Nostradamus had signed to mine old friend Aziraphale with best wishes. Mother Shipton had spilled drink on his copy, and in a climate control cabinet in one corner was the original scroll in the shaky handwriting of St. John the Divine of Patmos, whose revelation had been the all-time bestseller. Aziraphale had found him a nice chap, but a bit too fond of odd mushrooms. What the collection did not have was a copy of the nice and accurate Prophecies of Agnes Nutter, and Aziraphale walked into the room holding it like a king philatelist might hold a mar maritonis blue that had just turned up on a postcard from his aunt. And if anybody doesn't know what a philatelist is, it, that is a stamp collector. <laughs> just letting y'all know. <laughs> he had never seen a copy before, and he, but he had heard about it. Everyone in the trade, which considering it was a highly specialized trade, meant about a dozen people had heard of it. His existence was sort of a vacuum around which all sorts of strange stories had been orbiting for hundreds of years. As Zerifa realized, he wasn't sure if you could orbit a vacuum, but he didn't care. The nice and accurate prophecies made Hitler diaries look like, well, a bunch of forgeries. His hands hardly shook at all as he laid it down on the bench, pulled on a pair of surgical rubber gloves, and opened it reverentially. Aziraphale was an angel, but he also worshipped books. The title page said, The nice and accurate prophecies of Agnes Nutter is slightly smaller type, being a certain and precise history from the present day into the ending of this world. By the way, very middle English. So I'm reading as I would English. And slightly larger type, containing therein many diverse wonders and precepts for the wise. And a different type, more complete than ever yet before published. In small type, but in capitals, concerning the strange times ahead. In slightly desperate italics, and events of a wonderful nature. And a larger type, once more, reminiscent of Nostradamus at his best, Ursula Shipton. <laughs> the prophecies were numbered, and there were more than 4,000 of them. Steady, steady, as Erfeld murmured to himself. He went to the kitchen and made himself some cocoa and took some deep breaths. Then he came back and read a prophecy at random. Forty minutes later, the cocoa was untouched. The red-haired woman in the corner of the hotel bar was the most successful war correspondent in the world. She now had a passport in the name of Carmine Zugaber, and she went where the wars were. Well, more or less. Actually, she weren't where the wars weren't. She had already been where the wars are. Or were. She was not well known except where it counted. Get half a dozen war correspondents together in an airport bar in the conversation will, like a compass orienting to north, swing around to Murchison of the New York Times, to Van Horn of Newsweek, to Anne Forth of ITN News, the war correspondents, war correspondents. When Murchison, but when Murchison and Van Horn and Anne Forth run into each other in a burnt out tin shack in Beirut or Afghanistan or Sudan after they admired each other's scars and down a few, they would exchange odd anecdotes about a red Zugaber from the National World Weekly. That dumb rag merchant would say, it doesn't goddamn know what it's goddamn got. Actually, the National World Weekly did know just what it got. It had a war correspondent, but it didn't know why. But it just didn't know why and what to do with one now that it had her. A typical National World Weekly would tell the world how Jesus' face had been seen on a Big Mac bun bought by someone in Des Moines. With an artist's impression of the bun, how Elvis Presley was recently cited working in a burger lord in Des Moines. How listening to Elvis records cured her Des Moines housewives of cancer. How the spate of werewolves infesting the Midwest were the offspring of noble pioneer women raped by Bigfoot. <laughs> and that Elvis was taken by space aliens in 1976 because he was too good for this world. And here's a footnote. Remarkably, one of these stories is true. That was the National World Weekly. National World Weekly is kind of like uh, Weekly World News. You might say, you know, or like, you know, that, that kind of thing. Weekly World News is, is like the dirt sheet for the faux supernatural. <laughs> for those of you that might not know. They sold four million copies a week and they needed a war correspondent like they needed an exclusive interview with the General Secretary of the United Nations. And here's a footnote. The interview was done in 1983 and went as follows. So you're the Secretary of the Na United Nations then. See, ever cited Elvis? <laughs> So they paid Red Zuckerberg a great deal of money to go find wars and ignored the bulging, badly typed envelopes she sent them occasionally from around the globe to justify her generally fairly reasonable explanatory claims. They felt justified in this because, as they saw it, she wasn't 
She really wasn't a very good war correspondent, although she was undoubtedly the most attractive, which counted for a lot on the National World Weekly. Her war reports were always about a bunch of guys shooting each other with no real understanding of the wider political ramifications and, more importantly, no human interest. Occasionally, they would hand one of her stories over to the rewrite man to fix up. Jesus appeared to nine-year-old Manuel Gonzalez during a pitch battle on the Rio Concorsa and told him to go home because his mother was worried about him. I knew it was Jesus, said the brave little child, because he looked like he did when his picture miraculously appeared on my sandwich box. <laughs> Mostly, the National World Weekly left her alone, and carefully, he filed her stories in the rubbish bin. Murchison and Van Horn and Anforth didn't care about this. All they knew that whenever a war broke out, Ms. Zuckerberg was there first, practically before. How does she do it? They would ask each other incredulously. How the hell does she do it? And their eyes would meet in silence and say, If she were a car, she'd be made by Ferrari. She's the kind of woman you'd expect to see, the beautiful consort to the corrupt generalissimo of a collapsing third world country, and she hangs around with guys like us. We're the lucky guys, right? Ms. Zuckerberg just smiled and bought another round of drinks for everybody on the National World Weekly and watched the fights break out around her and smiled. She had been right. Journalism suited her. Even so, everyone needs a holiday, and Red Zuckerberg was on her first in 11 years. She was on a small Mediterranean island, which made, which made its money for the tourist trade, and that in itself was odd. Red looked to be the kind of woman who, if she took a holiday on any island smaller than Australia, would be doing so because she was friends with the man who owned it. And if you told her any islander a month before that war was coming, he would have laughed at her and tried to say you're a raffia work mind holder or a picture of the bay done in seashells. That was then. This was now. Now a deep religio-political divide concerning which four small mainland countries that they weren't actually a part of had split the country into three factions, destroyed the statue, statue of Santa Maria in the town square and done for the tourist trade. Red Zuckerberg sat the bar of the Hotel de Palomar de Sol, drinking what passed for a cocktail. One corner, a tired pianist played, and a waiter and toupee crooned into a microphone. A man threw himself through the window, a knife between his teeth, a collision of cough, an automatic rifle in one hand, a grenade in the other. I claim this of order, order, he paused. <clears throat> he took the knife out of his mouth and began again. I claim this hotel in the name of the pro-Turkish liberation faction. The last two holiday makers remaining on the island. Here's a footnote. Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Threlfall of Nine to Elms Pegnanton, they always maintained that one of the nice things about going on holiday was not having to read the newspapers or listen to the news, just getting away from it all, really. And due to a tummy bug contracted by Mr. Threefall and Mrs. Threefall rather overdoing the sun their first day, this was their first time out of their hotel room for a week and a half. Climbed underneath the table, read unconcernedly with, withdrew the maraschino cherry from her drink, put it to her scarlet lips, and sucked it slowly off it, sticking away. That made several men in the room break into a cold sweat. The pianist stood up, reached into his piano, and pulled out a vintage sun machine gun. This hotel has already been claimed by the pro-Greek Territorial Brigade. He screamed, you make one false move and I'll shoot out your living daylight. There was a motion at the door. A huge, black-bearded individual with a golden smile and a genuine antique Gatling gun stood there with a cohort of equally, huge, equally huge, although less impressively armed men behind him. This strategically important hotel for years, a symbol of the fascist imperialist turco greek running dog tourist trade, is now the property of the Italian Maltese freedom fighters, he boomed affably. Now we kill everybody. Rubbish, said the pianist. It's not strategically important, just as extremely well-stocked vine cellar. He's right, Pedro, said the man with the Kalashnikov. That's why my lot wanted it. Uh, Il General Ernesto de Montoya said to me, he said, Fernando, the war will be over by Saturday, and Lazo will be wanting a good time. Pop down to the Hotel de Pal Palomar de Sol and claim it as booty, will you? The bearded man turned red. Is bloody important strategically? Fernando Chianti. I drew a big map of the island. It's right in the middle, which makes it pretty bloody strategically important, I can tell you. Ha! said Fernando. You might as well say that because little Diego's house has a view of the decadent capitalist topless private beach that it's strategically important. Pianist blushed deep red. Our lot got that this morning, he admitted. There was silence. In the silence was a faint, silken, rasping red had uncrossed her legs. The pianist Adam's apple bobbed up and down. Well, it's pretty strategically important, he managed, trying to ignore the woman on the barstool. I mean, if someone landed a submarine on it, you'd want to be somewhere where you could see it. Silence. Well, it's a lot more strategically important than this hotel anyway, he finished. Pedro coughed ominously. The next person who says anything, anything at all, is dead. He grinned, hefted his gun. Right, now everyone against the far wall. Nobody moved. They weren't listening to him anymore. They were listening to the low, indistinct murmuring from the hallway behind them. Quiet and monotonous. There was some shuffling along the cohort in the doorway. They seemed to be doing their best to stand firm, but they were being inexorably edged out of the way by muttering. 
which had begun to resolve itself into audible phrases. Don't mind me, gents. What a night, eh? Three times around the island, and nearly f couldn't find the place. Someone doesn't have to believe in signposts, eh? Still found it in the end. Had to stop mass four times. Finally asked the post office. They always know the post office. Had to draw me a map here. Got here somehow. Sliding serenely past the men with guns like a pike through a trout pond came a small bespectacled man in a blue uniform carrying a long, thin, brown paper wrapped parcel tied with string. Why is it that I picture Stanley when I read that? I don't know why. I guess because he's played delivery men in the Marvel movies before. <laughs> His sole concession to the climate were his open-toed brown plastic sandals, although his green woolen socks he wore underneath them showed his deeper natural distrust of foreign weather. He had a peak cap on with International Express written on it in large white letters. He was unarmed, but no one touched him. No one even pointed the gun at him, but just stared. The little man looked around the room, scanning the face, and then looking back down at his clipboard, and then he walked straight over to Red, sitting, still sitting on her bar stool. Package for you, miss, he said. Red took it and began to untie the string. The International Expressman coughed discreetly and presented the journalist with a well thumbed receipt pad and a yellow plastic ballpoint pen attached to the clipboard by a piece of string. You have to sign for it, miss. Just there. Print your full name over here. Signature down there. Of course, Red signed the receipt pad illegibly and then printed her name. The name she wrote was not Carmine Zugerberg. It was a much shorter name. The man thanked her kindly and made his way out, muttering, Lovely place you got here, gents. I was meant to come here on holiday. Sorry to trouble. Excuse me, sir. And he passed out of their lives as serenely as he come. Red finished opening the parcel. People began to edge around for a better look. Inside the package was a large sword. She examined it. It was a very straightforward sword, long and sharp. It looked both old and unused, and it had nothing ornamental or impressive about it. This was no magical sword, no mystic weapon of power and might. It could very obviously... A sword created a slice, chop, cut, preferably killed, but failing that irreparably maim, and a very large number of people indeed. It had an indefinable aura of hatred and menace. Red clasped the hilt in her exquisitely manicured right hand and held it up to eye level, the blade glinted. All right, she said, stepping down from the stool. Finally! She finished the drink, hefted the sword over one shoulder, and looked around at the puzzled factions who now encircled her completely. Sorry to run out of you chaps, she said. Would love to stay and get to know you better. The men in the room suddenly realized they didn't want to know her better. She was beautiful, but she was beautiful in the way a forest fire was beautiful. Something to be admired from a distance, not up close. And she held her sword and she smiled like a knife. There were a number of guns in the room. Slowly, tremblingly, they were focused on her chest, her back, and head. They encircled her completely. Don't move! Quote Pedro. Everybody else nodded. Red shrugged. She began to walk forward. Every finger on every trigger tightened almost of its own accord. Lead and the smell of cordite filled the air. Red's cocktail glass smashed in her hand. The room's remaining the mirrors exploded in lethal shards. Part of the ceiling fell down. And then it was over. Carmine and Zuckerberg turned and stared at the body surrounding hers as if she had the faintest idea how they came to be there. She licked a spatter of blood someone else's. From the back of her hand with a scarlet cat like tongue, and she smiled. When she walked out of the bar, heels clicking on the tiles like the tapping of distant hammers. The two holiday makers climbed out from under the table and surveyed the carnage. This wouldn't have happened if we'd gone to the Tormelinos like we usually do, one of them said plainly. Foreigners, sighed the other. They're just not like us, Patricia. Well, that settles it then. Next year we go to Brighton, said Miss Threlfall, completely missing the significance of what just happened. It meant there would, wouldn't be a next year. It rather lower the odds on there being any next week to speak of. All right, and that, my friends, is the end of part two of my live reading of Good Omens. We have, uh, I would say, since it's separated into days like that, because that was just Wednesday, <laughs> apparently. Uh, we have Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So there'll be at least three more sessions of this before we switch to another book. I need to get the uh, the book, the other book images uh, ready for that. But um, I am going to swap over to gaming, but I am going to do a quick BRB to kind of set this aside. I hope y'all enjoyed the, the live reading. I know I've only been at it for an hour and a half, but my voice can only take so much. And I usually allot about, you know, four hours to a stream. I've never said I was going to read for all four hours. <laughs> um, 
because I think each section of this actually gets longer. Let me take a look and see how long Thursday is, because... I don't know. Thursday. Alright. Saturday's the biggest section, because it's basically the end of the book. So, and of course we have the rest of the book, too. <sighs> I think maybe next Wednesday I'll do Thursday and Friday um, together, and then we'll have like two sessions instead. And that way, it's, I'll be going for a little longer. Huh? Trust me, I have plenty to drink. It's just sometimes the 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 old throat doesn't get a whole lot of. Uh, me, 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 me. But anyway, I hope y'all enjoyed this. I know I have. I enjoyed. I love the book. I'm not signing off as yet, but I am going to take a quick beer and then we're going to swap over to some uh, My Time Porsche. Um, this and the first part will hopefully be up on YouTube. I need to make a list of things to do. I just do. I'm just terrible at content creation sometimes. And here lately, things have been really hectic. So um, <laughs> I, I appreciate everybody stopping by and hanging out. Uh, I will be right back after these messages.